Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. So today we're going to go to Romans 12, and we, we saw last week something that is, um, well, for my Sicilian upbringing was a real choker for me to learn in the scriptures that vengeance did not belong to me, according to the scripture. Well, it says vengeance is mine, but it wasn't, wasn't Izzy quoting it. It says, thus saith the Lord at the end of Romans 12. You see that there in, 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 in the verse, verse uh, 20. Uh, verse or the end of verse 19 it says never take your own revenge beloved but leave room it says leave room for the wrath of God for it is written vengeance is mine and I will repay says the Lord he says and if your enemy's hungry feed him if he's thirsty give him a drink for in so doing you heap burning coals upon his head we went over this last week but since the recording didn't come out I want to just do it again the burning of the coals was not heaping to burn them it was to to bless them that's the way that you passed fire along so that they could heat them they could cook their food they could heat and warm themselves it was a blessing to give and i use the example of the of the guys that i watched on that one of those reality tv shows you know where they were 40 days uh xl survival naked and afraid type thing and and, and i was watching it and they had different groups out there in the wilderness they didn't know about the other groups but one group had made fire, and the other group couldn't get it started. And when they came together, this group was like, Do you have fire? Oh, yeah. And it was like such a present. You know, like they just took some coals, put it in this little thing so the guy could carry it. But he was complaining the whole time that the smoke was coming in his face. And I'm thinking, if you knew the biblical way, what they used to do back there, in the Middle East, they put, the, they put this clay, well, they put it like a cloth. They twist it in a little circle. It looks like a little... I don't know cloth crown I guess you call it or whatever like a it's not a bandana because it's kind of on top of your head you know like a squishy thing and they put a clay platter on top of it and they can walk I mean they put big water pots on their heads and they can walk and they just walk along and hold all on top of their head but if you're carrying this makes a lot this is really wise after watching that show and I was watching the guy get burned from the smoke and in the eyes I'm thinking if you would just do what they do in the in the in the Middle East they would just put a clay plate on their head and put the coals up here so that where's the smoke go up you know and they just walk up and, but they have now the gift of fire that they can take and start their fire and warm themselves heat their you know their water cook their food and so i go ah th- but that means you're doing good to your enemy not evil remember what, what back up it said in verse 14 bless those that persecute you bless and do not curse you're supposed to do good to the people who do you evil. And I didn't have time to go to this, but I'd like to start today with turning to Exodus 23. This is from the from the law of Moses. In, um, and many people are, are familiar with Exodus 20. That's the chapter where the Ten Commandments are. After the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus 20, they break down the Ten Commandments into smaller little sub-commandments. And in one of the sub-commandments, they're called the sundry laws. In other words, they, how do you apply these things, these Ten Commandments, to your neighbor? How do you live out these things? And um, in verse, chapter 23 of Exodus, it says, you, in verse 1, You shall not bear false report against your neighbor, and do not join your hand with a wicked man, or be a malicious witness. Never, never, you know, what, what's malicious? Mean. mean. Don't be a mean witness against somebody. And you shall not follow I- I- I the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. Just because a lot of other people are going, the crowd is going this way to pervert justice, what does the sundry law say we should do? Don't join them. Don't, don't join in to doing stuff that's, that's wrong. Don't pervert what is right. And nor shall you be partial, it says, to a poor man in his dispute. If you meet a... Now listen to this, verse 4. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering in the way, it says, you shall surely return it to him. 
And if you see your, your, the donkey of one who hates you, and it's lying helpless under its load, it says you shall refrain from leaving it to him. Instead, you shall surely release it with him. So you see your, your, your neighbor, this is your enemy, not your friend, okay? You, you have an enemy, and they, they use the example of an ox or a donkey. Back then, those were, those were um, very, very precious um, commodities, though. Maybe like owning a car. You know, or well, no, more like more like a, yeah, SUV or, or a tractor. Actually, an ox was an ox you could use to plow the field. You know, a donkey was we could call it all-terrain vehicle because, like, we use them in Arizona to go take people down the Grand Canyon trails. Um, donkeys are are really good at bearing a heavy load, and they can they can carry a couple people on their back down a really steep, you know, windy road, and they don't. They, not that they like you, but they'll do it. You know, <laughs> you can train them. They're a little bit stubborn, but but it says here if you meet your enemy's ox or your enemy's donkey, okay, that'd be like if you found your enemy's um, four wheel drive or his tractor just sitting on you know your property, just happened to I don't know shift into gear and make its way over to your house. <laughs> if you found your enemy, see. Okay, I'm just gonna be honest. When I was brought up, it was finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Okay, that is not in the sundry laws. It's exactly the opposite. Okay, the sundry law says, if you find your neighbor's thing, what are you supposed to do? Return it. Return it. it doesn't. Say, if you see your neighbor's donkey has got a heavy load on it, and you can tell that donkey is like the, I don't know, it wandered over and it's sitting there and it's like loaded down. And it needs to be freed from the burden. He says, you shall go and help your neighbor to unload the donkey. That would be like saying, if you see your neighbor just pull up with the moving truck, and they have to unload it, which we would not want to go help, right? And like, oh, no, not the neighbor with the moving truck. <laughs> if you see, and he's your enemy, what are you supposed to do? According to the Sunday law, you're supposed to go help him. Now, why would you help your enemy? Well, we went over that. When you bless your enemy, when you help your enemy. This is the way the, the chapter ended in verse, look at the end of Romans 12 again. It ends with, do not be overcome by evil, but instead overcome evil with what? The good. The way that you overcome an enemy is not doing evil for evil. It's two wrongs never make a right. If you want to overcome a wrong that your enemy has done you or your neighbor, that's just not your friend to me. I mean, they are your, they're, they're, yeah, they're not even a friend. They're just your neighbor enemy. And you get, in life, unfortunately, we don't always get to choose our, our neighbors. You do the best you can to shop for the best deal for a house in the nicest neighborhood, and then you turn out to have a jerk of a neighbor. And they just do you mean things. And they come over while you're doing Bible study at night down at the Regency and they cut down all your plumeria trees down and leave them laying on the ground. I had one my neighbor do that to me. Cut all my plumeria, I mean, trees that had been growing for like 20 years. They had nice thick trunks. He just came and my neighbor thankfully across the street saw him. What are you doing? And stopped him, but it was too late. He had already butched down. The, 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 two thirds of my trees on that side are all gone. And I was just like heartbroken. I mean, I was like, what are you doing, you know, crazy neighbor? And, uh, and what, 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 what does the scripture say? You return evil for evil, right? I'm going to go over there and cut his plumerias down. That's exactly what I thought at first. Okay, I'm just going to be, that, that's my Sicilian part coming out. That, but the Bible says you have to walk by the spirit so you overcome the deeds of the flesh. Because that's my flesh talking. Okay, that's, that's a serious flesh out moment when I say I'm going to go cut his stuff down and get him back but that's not what Jesus would do Jesus says you return for evil you return what? good in fact that's how you overcome evil and guys if I could pass this on to the young ones here that they learn this because you, you're going to run into some jerks I, I hate to tell you this but in life they breed they multiply. I don't know. They go everywhere. You, you think you're getting away from them and you find new ones, you know? And they're like offspring or 
or they're, or they're, they're, they're twins to the one you just left in the other place, you know. You just moved out of that neighborhood and moved to this neighborhood, and you find out that guy has a twin. And why does he have to live next door just in the same spot that the other guy lived next? You know, I mean, it happens in life. So the way that you deal with it is you do good. You just do good. And by doing good and never paying, it says here, verse 17 says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Don't do it. You never win. It says, instead, you respect what is right in the sight of all men. And if possible, so as far as it depends on you, thank, thank you, Paul, for putting this part in there. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now, there's some people you just can't be at peace with. That's why you put, if it be, you know, possible. But they're, they're, they're just, you, you're going to find some, the, there's a lot of wisdom in that line. That there's some people they just don't want to be at peace. So when they don't want to be at peace, what's the best thing? Keep them as your next door neighbor? No. Move. Or let them move. Or, you know, just ask God to move. Yes, there, there's, you have to understand, Paul is saying, don't take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. Don't worry about it. Leave, leave room. God can move that person on. Or God can do something to take that person out of the picture. Or he could convert him. And if anyone would know about that, it would be Paul, the guy writing this, because he used to be Saul, and he used to be killing Christians, and now he's saying, hey, you can't overcome this evil with evil, you have to do it with good. Because Paul said, I, though I was the chiefest of sinners, I have been shown the greatest measure of grace. Because without God's grace, he couldn't have been, he's, I am who I am by the grace of God. Because he was he was killing Christians before he became a Christian. He had he was locking them up in jail. He was a mean guy. And and Jesus had to give him a little spiritual gib slap on the back of the head and pack and blinded him for three days and said, Why are you persecuting me, Saul? And he went, Quick come back. Who who art thou, Lord, that I might serve thee? He said, I'm Jesus. And then for the next three days, he showed him everything he would suffer. And Paul went on to serve the Lord, even though he knew going in he was going to suffer. He had brought a lot of suffering to others. And Jesus said, you're going to get it back. This is where we got to realize God is very fair, no matter what. He does, nothing gets by him. Nothing. So leave room for God. This is a great word for, you know, when you, when you struggle with certain things. You just got to go, you know what? I'm just going to leave room for God. Just leave room for God and see what he'll do. Now we come to chapter 13, a chapter that used to just spiritually, like, gag me. I mean, one of the hardest chapters choked me, you know, like, this This part, I was like, I was not raised with this as my um, frame of reference. Just to, I'm pre-qualifying this, okay, because I'm going to read it to you, and you'll see. Some of you may have grown up with a similar upbringing to me, and you'll, you'll know what I'm saying. The rest of you, God bless you, you had a great existence, but this, this part was tough for me. It says here, verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 1 says, um, Every person is to be in subjection to what? To the higher power, to the governing authorities. For he says there's no authority except, except from God. And those which exist are established by God. And therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And those who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For a ruler, it says, is not a cause for fear for good behavior, but for evil. Now, if you don't want to have fear of authority, anyone here doesn't want to worry about authority, like like uh, those red and blue lights that flash, you know, when you're driving sometimes? If you don't want to have fear about the cops pulling you over, th I'm just paraphrasing this in today's vernacular. You don't want to have fear about that authority pulling you over. Then, what do you have to do? Just obey the spirit. Just obey the laws of the land. In fact, the scripture says you obey the laws of the land, it'll go well with you. Of course, for a kid who grew up liking to speed, this is really hard. I mean, this is like, you've got to be kidding me. I, I thought the gas pedal was the go thing and the brake is useless. You know, you don't really need that very often. I could downshift when I really needed to slow down. That way, the cops couldn't see me hit my light, brake lights, you know. We, we had it down to, I never drove automatic. That was too, you can't slow it down fast enough. But you could downshift real quick, you know. 
and, and bring it down without hitting the brakes. And, and, and you know, like you worked. I was always speeding. Does anyone here... No, I shouldn't do that. I was just saying, <laughs> does anyone here like to go fast besides me? You know, I mean, my best friend in high school had a Chevy SS Nova. And he put the biggest engine in it they could. And then we put a nitros kit on it. Oh, my gosh. And we would, in northern Arizona, the speed limit was... 65 in the slower part of the highway, 75 in the, the open part, and then 85 on the straightaway. Okay, that this is back many years. Now they've brought it down to, I think the highest is 65. But it used to be all the way up to, there's patches of 85, okay? Well, the problem was our favorite place to go fast was in the 65. It was what we called the up and downs. It was a straight thing of highway, but the highway went like this, gradual like this. But this gradual motion, when you're going about, I shouldn't say this, but about 105, it, um, it is so cool because every one of those humps launches the car to where you're, you're totally weightless. And you feel yourself come up and your stomach comes up and then it stays up and your body goes down and then you come down and then it goes up. And so what we do is we'd be going 65 <laughs> And coming, we, we time it. We're just to getting ready to start the up and downs. And it was just this patch of Arizona Highway that just did this for just a couple miles. But it was great. I mean, we would get going. And then you flip the nitrous switch and, and just floor it. And the, you just get pinned back. And, and so we get up to about 105 miles an hour. And we just whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. You know, and it's just like... It's like a, it was our cheap um, roller coaster, yeah. Woohoo! Woohoo! You know, each time was, and I just loved to do, I like, I mean, it wasn't good for the car, I know, it wasn't safe, all that. But yeah. Thank God there's angels. Mine's probably bald from pulling his hair out, going, ah, this is not again. But we did, we did stupid stuff because we like going fast. And this is my high school days. So, so when I read this verse, I became a Christian in my last year of high school, and I read this verse, and it says, you don't have to be afraid of authority if you do what is right. If you do what is wrong, look at the verse 4. Oh, great. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear a sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. I was kind of practicing evil a little, I admit it. I didn't... If I would have done what was right, I wouldn't have to be worrying. But because we weren't doing what was right, we were constantly rubbernecking, we call it. Look, look behind every... In Arizona, they have billboards. And the cops always park behind the billboard with their little radar gun. And we knew where they would be, you know, like the, the main places where our cops... only had a couple. In fact, when I was growing up, there was only one sheriff in the whole county. Then he got two other guys, and then it got worse because we had to, like, look for three different cars. But, but for most of my teen years, it was only one. And once we found him, we all had CB radios. Oh. Yes. So that was your guys' version of texting, was our CBs. We, we would call each other on a channel that we would, you know, and we would, we, we would use, and we would tell each other where he was. Because, we yeah, where's Smokey Alert? Smokey we know, once you know where he is... Oh then you know where you have to drive the speed limit. See, we thought speed limits were only mandatory where the cop was. <laughs> the rest of the time, as long as you had control, you knew what you're doing, fast reflexes, we were young, good cars, we could go faster. That's the way we thought. Now, what, what we were doing, was it dangerous? Yeah. I mean, we were idiots. I mean, looking back, we were really cuckoo. But, you know, I, I look back and I think, I read this, and I, and I thought, uh-oh. I'm supposed to, according to the Bible, if I want to not worry about it, I mean, you know, like, not having to be afraid of the authorities, then all i got to do is do what's right. This is kind of a continuation of the don't get sucked into evil. You know, don't, don't, you can't overcome evil with evil, so you have to overcome it by doing good. It's... We put a chapter distinction right here, chapter 13, in kind of a bad place. shouldn't even be there. Because the thought is continuing. It breaks it down to doing good to your neighbor. And then it turns to, what about to your leaders? You know, what about to our rulers that rule over us? 
If we do what's right, then we don't have to be afraid. But if we're doing what's wrong, the Bible points out you should be afraid. Okay? It's kind of like kids, you know. When you do what's wrong and mom and dad aren't there, right? <laughs> but they're the authority. Is it, do we act any different when they are there than when they're, they're not there? I mean, this is, this is how I figured this out. Look at this. Let me read you the next part. He says, you got to watch out. He says, therefore, it is necessary for you to be following the rules, be in subjection, not only because of wrath, not only because you're worried when your parents find out you broke the rule, or you find out that the, you know, the cops find out you broke the rule, but it says you also need to have y yourself given to, to following the leader for this reason, for your conscience sake. For your conscience. He says, because of this, well, you, you also uh, pay taxes and rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. So, he says, render to, to all what is due to them. Tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom customs due, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor is due. And owe nothing to anyone except one thing. What are we supposed to, to owe? Owe love one to another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. This is the, this is the greatest thing, he says. For in this, he says, you, you, you heard this, that you should not commit adultery, you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't covet. If there's any kind of commandment, he says it's all summed up in one saying. You should love your neighbor as what? As yourself. And, and love does no wrong to a neighbor. It says, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Remember Jesus taught that, you know, do unto others as you would have them. What? Do unto you. The, we, we call it the golden rule. By the way, the golden rule came from Jesus. He taught it in Matthew 7. There, right around verse 12. He says, he said, this is, the, this is what you do. You, you do unto others as you have them do. You treat your neighbor as you would want to be treated. You love your neighbor as you would want to be loved. And I don't know any of us that want to have punishment or judgment from our neighbor. So why are we wanting to punish and judge our neighbor? It doesn't make any sense. He says, you don't, you don't do that. Instead, Paul says, just give to each person what is due them. If honor is due to them, give them honor. If tax... Now, this is a hard one because, you know, in, in our culture, it's like, um, well, yeah, we pay taxes, but we don't want to pay taxes, so what can we do to get out of paying taxes? And, you know, it's an art form. We, we call them certified public accountants. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, tax guys and, you know, math dudes. Yeah, they figure out these loopholes and how to... But, you know, it's really ironic to me. Do you guys know the first gospel of the New Testament? The very first book of the New Testament is written by who? Matthew. Matthew. What was Matthew's occupation before he became a follower of Jesus? He's a tax collector, right? He's a tax collector. And Matthew, it's ironic to me because it, this is just to help you like find stuff in the Bible someday if you're like looking and, you're, and they ask a question. Well, I heard a story about Jesus talking about um, something to do with, with um, you know, he was tested about, they, they held up a coin and they said, um, they said to him, "Do we pay taxes?" And he said, "Give me a, give me a coin." And he held it up. He said, "Whose, whose inscription is this on the, on the coin?" They, you know, whose picture is that on the? They said, "Caesar's." And what was Jesus' answer? You guys remember this? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. He said, "This is money. This belongs to Caesar. Give it to him, but give to God what what belongs to God." Everything. He, so he go, Jesus said, now, there's another time where they tested Jesus, that, uh, well, actually one of his disciples, Peter. They came and said, does your rabbi pay the two drachma tax? Does he pay, you know, the poll tax? Like, is he a law-abiding citizen and pay tax? And they were trying to trap him. Peter went, yeah, sure he does. And then he went inside. <laughs> And Jesus asked him, so, um, Peter, is it lawful for, you know, like the, 
Do the kings tax their own sons? You know, like, do they collect taxes from their own kids? He's like, no, they're, they're exempt. They're, they're his children. You know, they only tax the other people. They don't tax their own family. And he goes, yeah, right. And we're the sons of God, and, you know, in God's kingdom, there's no tax. But, he says, lest we give him any offense, um, you know, because Peter just told the guy out the window. I wonder if Jesus was inside listening. Because Jesus says, so lest we give him any offense, Peter. Now, what was Peter's occupation before he... He was a fisherman. So he says, Peter, go throw your line in to the sea and pull up a fish. And the very first fish you catch, open its mouth and there'll be a stater, a gold coin. Go take that and pay the tax. It's enough for two men to pay their taxes. Now that, Peter, I, I, when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask for replay with sound thinking uh, subtitles. Because I want to hear what Peter was going through his mind, going, this Jesus guy is a good rabbi, but he's cuckoo. You know, like, I caught a lot of fish in my life. I never caught one, had a gold coin in its mouth. You know, like, this is going to be a new... You know, and Jesus was very specific. He said, the very first fish that you catch, open its mouth, and there'll be the coin. Now, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just curious if Peter just walked into the lake going, here we go. And as, do you guys ever read these stories and think, what if he told me to do it? He told me to go get, throw, and, and you know, he's a fisherman, so it's not like he's telling him to do something he doesn't know how to do. I wonder how long it took to catch the fish. But he throws the line in, yeah, I'm wondering if he just went, threw it in, pink in a bit right away. And then he opens it. I have a feeling, when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask for the replay, the whole thing. Like, like, did he sit at the shore having a conversation with God in his mind, you know? I know, Bob. The radio guys have to cut out that. But but so yeah so so he so so when we watch the replay, I'm gonna see what did he do, you know, and how long did he have to sit there waiting for the fish to bite? And when he caught the fish, when he opened his mouth, I want to hear right then the 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 replay of the of the the thinking in his mind when he went. Like, did he go, oh, I knew it was going to be there. Or did he go, oh, what a way to get your tax money, you know. And, okay, now, when I think of this story, I think right away, in the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark is um, an account from John Mark, but John Mark got most of his information from Peter. So, it's affectionately in, in like when you go to Bible college you teach these little subtle things so that you can learn like where's the stories and stuff and and so I think well this could be Peter telling this story to John Mark but it is a tax story so if I had to guess like John's gospel nah Luke he's the doctor everything that has to do with like special healing you know real uh, a lot of detail. The guy was hand withered from his birth, thirty years or whatever, and then Jesus says, "Stretch forth." His... Anything to do with a healing, you can pretty much guess. I mean, there's only like an exception: the the man born blind in John nine. The rest of them, they're all in Luke. Okay, but if it has to do with taxes and money, and you don't, you play Bible trivia, and you just gotta take a good stab. What's your best bet to go with? Matthew. Matthew. Go with Matthew, because Matthew, being a tax collector himself formerly, seemed to key in on this story. And by the way, he's the one, not Mark, who tells the story. He's the one who... Let, let me just show it to you real quick. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew is the guy, the tax collector. Now, I bet he's just going, oh boy, this is going to be good. You know, he must have been there listening to Jesus. When Jesus, you know, <clears throat> here comes Peter. Now look at verse 24, Matthew 17, 24. When they came to, to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and they said, does your teacher, your rabbi, not pay the two drachma tax? And Peter said, yes. And then when he came into the house, it says, Jesus spoke to Peter first, saying, uh, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons 
are from strangers. And when Peter, he, he, he thought about it, he said, well, from strangers. And Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt, right? He's like, yep. Well, he says, however, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea, throw in a hook, and take the first fish. Now, Alfred just said, I wonder whether he baited his hook. I don't know. It just says throw in a hook. <laughs> Didn't say he even had to bait it. He just said throw it in. And the first fish, listen to this, that comes up, you will open its mouth and find a shekel or a stater is the King James. And you take it and give it to them for you and for me. Twice the, the tax for two men <coughs> paid. Have some neighbors with noisy cars. <laughs> and so he does it. Now Peter, I bet he was just like, oh, what a great way to get your taxes. I mean, I didn't have to get the fish, clean the fish, salt the fish, smoke the fish, sell the fish to get the money, right? I mean, to get this much money would have taken a lot of fish. A lot of cleaning, right? A lot of work, right? To get it all prepped. And the fish back then, they didn't have refrigeration, so you had to pack it in salt. And this is up in Capernaum. Well, you sold the fish down Jerusalem way in the market. So you're talking a lot of work. And Jesus goes, I'm going to save you the trouble. First hook. Just throw it in. Peter's going, he's a great spiritual teacher, but he knows nothing about fishing. You don't, you got to bait the hook. And I wonder if he's having a discussion with himself as he's going to the lake. Throw a hook in. Yeah, like, doesn't, doesn't he know you need a worm or you need something? You know, just a hook. Did it work? Yeah. So if the Lord tells you to do something because he wants to take care of you, could he direct you to go do something that might seem cuckoo to, to you know, your, your natural mind, you'd be like, I don't think about I don't want to do this. I, I, I was sharing with the young men at, at our, at, at, just the other day, about the man who discipled me in Christ, Bill Elander. He, he was our youth leader, assistant pastor at our church, and he had an assistant pastor salary, which back then was nothing. He lived in a little pull-behind trailer, one of those, you know, hook it onto it, 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 and, and he rented the land that it sat on in one of, from one of the ladies in the church the out in the back of her field, you know, to pull part of the trailer there. And Bill, he, he just, he had a super low budget to live off of. And he needed rent. Now, not like rent today where you have to pay, you know, a couple thousand dollars for a one-room place. You know, but it was um, like $183 he needed. And he was like, ah, Lord, I, I need my money. And he had read this story about Peter. And, and, and he's discipling me, so he's telling me about the story that I, you know. See, so if God tells you to do something, you, you know, even it seems like it wouldn't work. If he tells you to go whatever, you should go do it. Then he says that he teaches me the story and the Lord speaks to his heart. Go out behind the, the, the building, the, the bat, we shared a the dumpster. You know those dump, big dumpsters, the ones you can climb into, you lift the lids. And yeah. We shared a dumpster with, with the business next door, and, and the Lord told him, go in the dumpster and, and look for the Contadina tomato paste can. Now, I know Contadina because that's my grandma and my nonna used to use only their tomato paste. It's the best, you know. So, so he tells me, that God tells him to go look in the dumpster for a Contadina tomato paste kit. But he's a big guy. And he's uh, proud. He's like, I, I'm not climbing in no dumpster. You know, I'm not a dumpster diver. I'm a servant of the Lord, but not a dumpster diver. And I was poor. So I was way beyond, like, any... Like, it... it if it meant money is available, I'd do it. You know, like, who cares? You just, the Lord's telling you to go look for a can in the dumpster, then go look. I mean, and weren't you the one who just told me that, like, what if Peter would have said, this hook thing ain't going to work? And he never threw the line in the sea. Would he ever know? He would have never known. 
You had never seen the provision what God had for him. So, Bill's giving me this whole thing. We're talking about it. And I'm like, I'll go. You know, no, oh, I'll do You know, it was like a big, yeah, yeah, you know. Anyway, the Lord got him over himself. And he finally, you know, checked. And he said, I, I, I'm supposed to be teaching you. And the Lord's telling me to go. And anyway, he, he finally climbed in the dumpster, this big guy. Went down and he said it was in the very corner, down low to the bottom. So he had to get past the rubbish to get to it. And it had the lid that had, you know, used a can opener, open almost all the way, but not all, it wasn't popped out. So it, it was like a little hinge, you know, the lid was still attached. And it was closed down. The Lord told him, there's your, there's your rent. And he's like... Yeah, right. It's opened, you know. And he goes, look. And he opened it up, and in it was rolled up dollars. Oh, my gosh. And he had, like, $200. And he needed 183 oh, something like that. So he was like, <gasps> and I'm like, dude, if God tells you to go to any other dumpsters, I'll go for you, you know. Like, I mean, that is cool. Like, I mean, and, I mean, this is a guy teaching me about Jesus, and yet he was so embarrassed to tell me this testimony. You know, the Bible says we overcome in our faith by three things. We, 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 in Revelation, it says that they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' blood is what gets us past the devil. And the word of their testimony. And the last thing, that they don't love their lives even to death. They're willing to lay down their lives. And you know what? As a Christian, I have to just lay down my life and say, okay, whatever you want me to do, Lord, even if it doesn't make sense. I was telling the boys, what if the Lord tells you, you know, you're heading to the beach and the Lord says, stop right, pull over. Just pull over. I have something for you. You're like, what? I was telling him, we have this friend, Tom, uh, in fact, his wife, Claire, let us um, start our church almost 25 years ago in her house in Sunset. It's funny, today we're having a house church but years ago that's where we started it wasn't in a house and and they had a son and their son used to take this metal detector he got he upgraded to the one that can go underwater you know and and, and you know like can be in the waves and stuff and he went and he found a ring a, a anniversary ring it was like almost three quarters of a million dollars of diamond it was so big and he was he was like i mean of all of his finds he had pop tabs and all this other stuff he showed me that he found. But in the in the whole pile of everything he had, he had one little pouch in his, his uh, you know those fanny pack things? One little pouch of the fanny pack that had his real finds. And in that, he had gold jewelry and, and different things that he had found at the resorts. He man, those rich people, they go swimming with their jewelry on. So he figured it out. Just go up there and Go in them, you know, just look. They don't swim deep. They never swim deep. They're always like only up to their knees. Just standing there in the water. Do, 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 do. Going up and down the beach. And he's coming home with jewelry. He, he had found some ladies' w wedding band. And they were so grateful. They gave him like a huge tip, you know. Like he, he returned it to them and they were just like... This one he actually advertised. He, he brought it to the jeweler, found out how much it was worth. He's like, I better... You know, put a thing I found it or whatever. He got he got like a what was it, a few hundred. It was a cheap. The rich person was a chintz. I mean, they gave they gave him like a couple bucks for for oh thanks for finding my ring. But but I had it insured. That was her that was her answer. I had it insured. It wouldn't matter. And I was thinking, dude, you should have saved it. You know, that's my mind. <laughs> but but you know, he he was honest. He returned it. And. And oh, from, from these things, you know, like what we, I, I told the boys, what if the Lord told you just to stop on the side of the road and open your door and look down? What if he had a penny there? And they're like, what? I said, yeah, just pick it up. And you don't know, it's a 1943 copper penny. They're only worth what? Right now they go a hundred to $250,000. They're really rare. The, the ones that during our wartime we, we went to steal pennies in that year. But they made a few coppers from the leftovers from 42. 
those blanks got run. And they're so rare and collectible that all the Lord has to do is put a penny in your path and your whole, you know, day might have a different outlook, you know? But you wouldn't know that that penny is there and you wouldn't know to, to get it unless you are willing to listen to what Jesus tells you to do. Guys, I have to tell you, there is such a sweet thing to this one. Because Paul is, he's the one writing this. He's saying, guys, you know, you obey the laws and stuff so that for your conscience sake, so you have a good conscience. And he says, when he wrote to Timothy, he wrote in the first chapter of 1 Timothy, he said, the goal of our instruction as preachers, this should be the goal of all pastors, I, I think. The goal. Let me show you what it is. Just so you, in case someone ever asks you, what's Izzy's goal? Okay, is not to get your money. I know some preachers. That's their goal. Is how many offerings they can take up from their congregation and and how much money they can make. But this is the goal that I learned from the scripture and and really try. I try to live this. Paul's writing to Timothy. His understudy he says, Timothy, First Timothy, chapter one, verse five. This is the goal of our instruction. It's that you have love from a pure heart. We just went over the last few weeks from chapter 12. How to love without being a what? A hypocrite. How to love with true love. And then the second thing, second goal, love from a pure heart, second part, a good conscience. And the last thing, sincere faith. This is the goal, this is my goal, that, that, that I would have to encourage you to become a person that has love from a pure heart and that you have a good conscience. There's nothing worse than Christians that are doing wrong, straddling the fence, so to speak. I get a lot of the college-age ones are like, so how much can I do wrong and still be in the club? <laughs> how much is okay with God? And You know, they, they want to know, like, how much bad can I do and still be okay with God? The answer, that's not a good conscience. You're never going to have a clear conscience. Now Paul, in Acts 23, he actually stands up before the, before the assembly and says, I have lived my life to this very day with a clear conscience. And they, they wanted to stone him. How dare you say that? But it, it wasn't like Paul was perfect. In fact, 1 Timothy, he says in verse 15 of the same chapter, he says, it's a trustworthy statement, he says, that that des it's deserving of full acceptance. Everyone accept this fact. That Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Among whom I am foremost of all. He, Jesus didn't say, I mean Paul didn't say, Jesus came to save sinners, you other bad people. No, not like me, I'm the good one. No, he's like, I am the chiefest of the sinners. And it's a trustworthy statement. Jesus came to save us. That's what he came to do. And, and how, could, but how could he stand up in front of the whole group and say, I have a clear conscience? What clears our conscience? Do you guys know? This is important. I'm going to end with this today. What clears our conscience? When we, what, what is a guilty conscience? What, what, what's it feel like when we have a guilty conscience? What, what causes us to have a guilty conscience? We do something wrong, right? And we, and we, and we, we know that we shouldn't... I, I hear this all the time. Pastor, I know I shouldn't have done it. But, so why are you calling me now? Well, I was hoping you got some prayer or something you do and get rid of this bad feeling I got. Feeling kind of, you know. Yeah, well, there is a prayer. In fact, it's found in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If you confess your sin, John says, that God is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and not just forgive, but what? Cleanse you of all unrighteousness. It's his cleaning work that he does when he cleanses us that clears our conscience. It, it, it just, you know, we, yeah, we've blown it, but the, but are we going to have to pay a penalty for that blowing it in God's sight? God goes, no, I've already paid for it with my son. You're forgiven. Now, if you don't ask forgiveness, good luck with getting rid of a guilty conscience. You're going to feel terrible until you, you fess up, man. That's just the way it goes. <coughs> But as soon as you confess your sin to the Lord, He is faithful and just, and He forgives you, and He cleanses you. And you get a clear conscience. Now, Paul must have said, Lord, I'm sorry. 
for what I did. Because he was able to stand up later in front of the whole Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees together and say, I've led my life with a clear conscience to this very day. Like, he, he was able to say, and that's a good feeling, by the way. You know when your conscience is clear, how good that feels? Like, some of you look at me like, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, no, it's really good. It's actually a great feeling. It's better, like, like the whole tax thing. I'd rather just pay the taxes to the government and have a clear conscience. Because if you don't do it, and you ever get a call from the IRS, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm going to tell you, those guys are scary. Okay, I'm from first-hand experience. We had a year, this is nothing to boast about, but we had a year in the church here where the finances were so low that the accountant lady told me, you, Pastor, you don't even have to file. You have this thing called reduction of paperwork, you qualify. You didn't make enough to have to file your taxes. I go, I've always filed my taxes. She goes, you don't have to. I got a new rule. She took me to the page, circled it, this paragraph, you don't have to file. I didn't file that year. I thought, well, okay, first time. It feels a little awkward, but I'll do it. You know, it's like, kind of sounds okay. Until the phone rang. <laughs> and it was this IRS agent with this scary, nasty-like <coughs> thing. You have been audited. You must call back for your, your audit session. You must da 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 We can seize your bank accounts. We can freeze your money. We can do all this. And you're just like, and I'm thinking, if I did something wrong, just this call alone would scare the bejeebies out of me, you know? I mean, they, they word it in such a way that you're like, oh, man. And, and, and it's like, we got you. You're guilty before. It's, it's more like guilty till proven innocent, not innocent till proven guilty with them. They're, the, they're, they're scary. And I was thinking, but I didn't do anything wrong. And so I called the, the account lady right. Could you tell me what paragraph? I know it was on the right-hand side of the booklet, but what was the page number? And she... She told me, and I got out the booklet, and I circled the page. I put a little dog ear on the corner, you know. And I got the phone number, and I waited to the time I was supposed to call, and I called back, and I got a real person, and they were real gruff. Why didn't you file your tax? You didn't file your return. You're being audited. I said, yes, sir, I didn't, because um, my accountant lady said that according to this new paperwork reduction thing, I didn't make enough, and so on page, and I told him the page number, and on the inner column halfway down, it says right here, and I read it to him, and he goes, you tell me you didn't make that much money? And I was like, wait a minute, I work for the church, they send you my, my what I make. You guys have my paperwork already. And he goes, well, you tell me that's all you got? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, oh. <laughs> Do you want to keep your case open? waiting for this part again. He goes, do you want to keep your case open? I go, would there be any benefit in that? He goes, not really. I said, no thanks. He goes, and then he gets nice at the end. Okay, have a nice day. But up to then, I'm telling you, if I would have done something wrong, Mike, if I would have cheated somehow, they, they know that people cheat. And if you do what's wrong... Man, I think they get people to fess up right off the bat because they did something wrong. I mean, they're scary. <laughs> and, and they got lawyers. They're, they're Guys, my son was asking, so, you know, should we... I said, it, it's your conscience. But the goal of my instruction is to teach my own kids love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. When they have those things in life, life's a lot better. You know, you can't measure a good conscience in money. It's, there's no value, right? When your conscience is clear, you can sleep better at night. When you have a guilty conscience, good luck sleeping at night. You're going to start having stress, you're going to have anxiety, you have all sorts of, you know, in Italian we say agita, um, reflux, acid, of the acid yeah. reflux, the, the, the heartburn, the ulcers, you're going to get a lot of problems because the digestion doesn't do well when you're not at peace inside. So this is just practical Christianity. How to have a good conscience. Just how to do this and owe nothing to anyone except for one thing. Love. Just love one another. 
That's all we gotta do. That fulfills the whole law when we love the way Jesus would love. You're not sure what to do? Just the kids got it, don't they got little bracelets? WWJD. What would Jesus do? That's what it, what it, So would Jesus pay his tax? He did. Did he stress about it? No, Peter, go throw a hook. It didn't even say a baited hook. It said a hook. When we get there, I'm going to ask Peter, did you bait the hook or did you just obey and throw a hook? You think I... I got questions, man. When we get there, I, go, I am going to have for eternity to sit back and watch the replays on all these things I've been teaching you about that I got these little subtle questions about. So, what were you thinking? You know? I mean, does anyone else wonder... Like the two disciples that were supposed to go get the donkey for Jesus to ride in on. Just go untie it. And when they say, what are you doing untying that? Oh, the master has need of it. And they'll let you take it. I want to know which guy untied it. <laughs> and what were they saying when they were walking there? You untie it. No, you untie it. You untie it, I'll say the master has need of it. No, you untie it, I'll say the master has need of it. I mean, that's what I would have been doing on the way there. Because that was grand theft auto back then. You were stealing. Yeah. You are like stealing an all-terrain vehicle right there, taking that donkey. And you're going, let me just steal your baby donkey. No one's even got a chance to... This is a, this is a brand new vehicle, never even has any miles on it. I'm taking it right from the showroom. Low mileage, right? I mean, that's what they were doing. As soon as they did, went to untie. Do you guys remember the story in the gospel? Me waiting for the radio. As soon as they untied it, what happened? The guy said, What are you doing taking that donkey? They said, The master has need of it. I don't know if they both chimed in. This is on my questions list. Doesn't matter because you know what happened, right? Palm Sunday took place. They had to take it and they put Jesus on that donkey that no one ever rode on. That's a miracle in itself. That shows his mastery over nature. Because you can't sit on a donkey no one's ever sat on. I'm just telling you from growing up on a farm, they don't like it. You have to break them first. You have to, I mean, and Jesus just, they put a, they, they put a garment over its back and he sat on it. And it took him right in to Jerusalem. You don't do that unless you're the son of God. I mean, donkey whisperer. I mean, that's, he, that's like, from a farm boy, that's a big deal. Okay, that's, that's crazy that he did that. But people overlook that all the time in the story. If Jesus got mastery over the donkey, he's got mastery over making fish swallow money. <laughs> Didn't swallow, just hell. <laughs> you know, like, it, I mean, how much trouble is it? I mean, he took the bread, the loaves, the fish, broke it, blessed it, fed everyone. Do you think it's really hard for him to take care of you? For your taxes? For your whatever you're facing? I mean, he used a homeless guy to take care of my broken computer. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I mean, the Lord is good at his job. Let's be good at keeping our conscience clear so we can enjoy our faith. Really, it's a great thing. Let's enjoy it. Man, it's good. We'll pick up with this next week. This is, I, I hate to do this because it really does segue to the end of the chapter really beautifully, but if you can just keep that in your mind for me, next week we'll pick up with this. And we'll come back to it and uh, finish out this chapter. It's a beautiful ending in chapter 13. So read ahead for me if you would. Chapter, I know your bulletin doesn't say, but chapters 13 and 14. I'm going to try to go a little bit farther than just the end of the chapter next week. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for, for your word. I just pray it would sink into us and that we could live it. We could use it, Lord, in these days, what we live in. And we could live our lives truly with a good conscience and a sincere faith. And, Lord, we would have love that love for one another that fulfills the law, that love from a pure heart. Fill us, Lord, with your love to overflowing as we go on to start off this week. In Jesus' name. Everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.